meeting of what we're calling the multiple measure strike team for about the last two years. If you're on the multiple measure strike team, will you raise your hand? And um, one of the things that we've been working on is um, using the statewide rules to do a pilot study um, using multiple measures. So the goal of the multiple measures assessment project was to provide a more holistic, comprehensive, and accurate assessment. And the math and English levels for the pilot study, which included 654 students, used their active results, their overall high school GPA, and then the highest math class that they completed in high school. So then in our pilot study of the 654 students, 49% of those students from the group placed higher in math, and 40% of those students placed higher in English. We know now that about 460 two or three are now enrolled in um, fall courses. And so we thought it'd be a good time to ask uh, Dr. Hetz to come back. How many have heard Dr. Hetz before? Oh, good, repeat. Uh, and Dr. Hetz is a PhD and he was awarded the 2012 RP Group Award for excellence in research based on his study at Long Beach City College that demonstrated that high school cumulative GPA was by far the strongest predictor of performance in college courses. So um, I want to thank Dr. Hetz for, Dr. Hetz and his team have been here three or four times now, um, and I just want to thank him for being willing to come back. So thank you, Dr. Hetz, and welcome. Thank you. So uh, just a couple of business items straight off the bat. Um, uh, I'm tethered, so I'm feeling a little bit self-conscious. This is a new thing for me, so hopefully I'll just get used to it like we usually do. But uh, the most important thing is this. So uh, this is a bit.ly link. It's a link shortening device. If you click that link or go to that address, that'll take you to all the slides I'm presenting today. So that's the one thing that you need to take a picture of or write down. You have to do it in all caps. So it's MMAP, Multiple Measures Assessment Project, CC, Citrus College, 2017. And it has all the slides. And you'll see these throughout as well. So when you're going through the slides and you have, well, what, what research is that based on? Who did that work? Where can I get the original thing? That will take you to the original sites. It'll take you to the paper. It'll take you to the website where that information is hosted so that you can find out more information throughout. So you'll see those embedded throughout. Um, sometimes I'll comment on them more specifically. But generally, that will take you to all the resources that you can use to you know, build on what we talked about today. Uh, the other thing is my email address and Twitter handle. If you're interested, feel free to send me emails. I get questions all the time, usually about four to five a day about different aspects of this project. And I do my best to answer as many of them as possible. And, uh, my bottom line for this is the potential of this type of work for our students and our for colleges is sufficiently large. I don't want anyone ever to not have a question that they have answered. Right? So, you know, with some reasonable understanding that I can't necessarily respond immediately all the time, uh, I try and get back to everyone as quickly as I can. Uh, and if you wait to the end, I also provide everyone my direct cell phone number, but you have to stay to the end to get the digits. That's the rule. Lunch. And there's lunch, so multiple reasons. Um, the only other thing I do ask is, you know, this is designed for you guys. Please don't forward, you know, quote this, send it to papers and stuff like that without at least checking with me. Right? That's just kind of a common courtesy. I'm happy to share this with other people. It's just when it gets beyond what we talk about in this room, things can very easily get you know, translated in the game of telephone to things that may not be exact. So if you want to share it with other people, just check. That's all I ask. Okay? All right. Um, the other thing I need to absolutely make sure to do is uh, point out that this is not my work. Right? This is the work of hundreds of people at Long Beach City College as we got started. Uh, on our work on the Promise Pathways and Alternative Assessment, as well as the work of thousands of people across the state. So we have a team of people working on the Multiple Measures Assessment Project, some fantastic, some of the best researchers in the state. Um, you know, she mentioned the RP award that I won. Between uh, the two of Craig Hayward and Terrence Willett, they've won about 15 of those. So these are folks doing the best research across the state. They're part of the team doing this work for everyone. And then we've been working with the Common Assessment Initiative, the Multiple Measures Work Group statewide, the California Community College's Chancellor's Office, the Academic Senate, anyone and everyone statewide who can be involved is. The other thing I would point out is we have, actually we're closer to about 70 pilot colleges now, so this also involves the faculty, staff, uh, administrative teams across the uh, entire system 
in ways that basically reflect the work that we're doing across the entire state of California to better understand the capacity of our students. Okay. All right. But I like to start with the story of data and Icarus. And so those of you who have seen me present before know this story so you don't get to answer the question, right? And you don't ruin it for other people. Um, but Daedalus was this really fantastic inventor, scientist who worked for a despotic king, King Minos. Uh, and for King Minos, he crafted, crafted this labyrinth of inescapable complexity. It was difficult to get out of by design so that people would get stuck in there and eaten by the Minotaur. Um, but Daedalus makes the mistake of actually helping someone help Theseus escape. And so for that offense, Minos traps Daedalus and his son Icarus in a tower. Uh, Daedalus, being the fantastic inventor that he is, you know, looks around at what they have available in their tower prison. And they have wax from the candles that they use for light. They have feathers from the birds that are sharing the tower space with them, flying in and out. So he says, ah, we can build wings and escape out of this tower. Huzzah. Right? But before we go, just Daedalus, you should know this is dangerous. If you fly too high, the heat from the sun will melt the wax, the feathers will fall off, and you'll crash to your doom. And lo and behold, Icarus, being the young man that he is, doesn't listen to his father, flies too high, the, the heat from the sun melts the wax, and he crashes into the seed now named after him. Uh, and this is often used as a tale that we use to talk about the dangers of innovation, the dangers of hubris, the importance of knowing your limits and listening to your elders. And we think about these things a lot. The problem is, there's an entire second part of what Daedalus tells Icarus that we basically have forgotten. And we're going to come back to that part of the Daedalus and Icarus story at the end. So assessment and placement. Community colleges, as well as four-year public access colleges, they are open enrollment. We have students that come to us with any variety of capacities and needs and shortcomings. They're coming to us across a wide span of ability to do the work. And so our goal, what we have to be able to do, is figure out how to get students in the best courses for them. That's the whole point of the assessment and placement process, to place students at the most appropriate skill level or most appropriate course level for the skill. Right? We're trying to match the challenges of the classroom with the capacity that they bring with them. And there's a huge ton of work in two different areas, both in uh, research and education, on the zone of proximal development and where students can optimally learn, as well as in positive psychology on things like optimal performance and flow. And what you see is in environments, educational environments, and more broadly, when you do this, when you match the skill to the challenge, that's where you get the best performances. That's where you get the most engagement in the classroom. That's where you get the most learning. And we seem to have forgotten some of that in the way that we do placement. So one of the things I do is just try and kind of put some you know, put some grist on the bones of this just to kind of remind us what we're trying to do, right? We're trying to get students in this, on this diagonal where the challenge that we have in the classroom matches the skills so they can achieve. We don't want them up here, right, where the challenge is too high, right? It's too hard for them. That's where you get things like worry and anxiety and the fear, right? Are you going to tell me again what I did wrong this time? Right? We don't want students to have that experience. It's a terrible experience. But we also don't want them in the bottom, right, where what they can do already on their own outpaces the challenges of the classroom. Because that's where you get things like apathy, boredom, and anger, right? frustration with having to show again that you can do the work that you've already successfully completed. So what we try and do right, is we're trying to keep students out of these two triangles where they can achieve the work without our help, right? They can do it independently. Or where even with our help, they can't do it. We're trying to move them in that middle zone where they can achieve with our instructional support in the classroom. Right? When they're in these zones, our goal right, is to try and move them into that center zone. And if you think about what our sequences are designed to do, what education in general is designed to do, is to take students, let me go back one, right, along this path. Right, to increase their skill and increase the challenge. Increase the skill, increase the challenge. So we need to keep students in this, work to improve their skill so they can move up to a more challenging task. That's what happens in our classes by semester. That's what happens in college in general. 
And the reason for that is this is where you get all those great things, right? Those fantastic experiences where at the end of the semester, the students stand up and do a report or a project that they had no idea that they could do before. This is where you get engagement. This is where you get improvement. This is where you get flow, these fantastic experiences. If you think back to like a thesis that you've written or your dissertation, remember that day that you started working and you really felt everything firing on all cylinders? And then suddenly it's 10 hours later, right? You were so immersed and engrossed in the task. That's what happens when these two things match, when the challenge that students are facing in the task that they're doing in the classroom match the skills that they have. And that's, of course, also where you tend to get the most success. So that's a lot, trying to summarize five or six decades of research in two different, very different disciplines. But I'm going to try and summarize it in one sentence. And this comes from a mathematician at the Singapore National Institute of Education. And it really resonates with me as a former bus rider, bus catcher. Right? So I had to take the bus every day to school from second grade all the way through the end of high school. And um, there are these moments right, that you can remember. They're stuck in your me memory, flashbulb type memories of what that experience is like. And I can tell you there's one particular moment that I remember really well with these. And that is that moment as I'm coming up to the bus stop and I see the doors on the bus close, right? And I know that if I just lay it all on the line, I can make it, right? Not when I see the bus pulling away from two blocks away. When it's too far, there's no point in running. If I'm already on the bus stop and the bus isn't there, I don't have to pay very close attention. When it comes, I'll, I'll be ready. But there's that moment, right? And we've seen it in lots of movies. It's the kid who all of a sudden has to find another gear. And so the way he captures this is if you think you can catch the bus, you'll run. And that's what we're trying to capture in the classroom academically, right? That students need to believe and be able to catch the bus, right? Be able to do the work if they know they can and if they put forth their effort. And so that's where you get maximum effort in the classroom. That's where you get these transformable, transformational experiences. When students are on that cusp of, if I put this out there, I can make it. But I'm going to have to do my best work. That's when you get the best work. So why are multiple measures important in assessment? Let's change gears a little bit and talk about what we want to talk about today. And we'll come back to those types of things. It's important to think about some basic assessment and measurement theory. Right? What happens when you measure or assess anything? Right? It's not perfect. Any measurement, any assessment isn't perfect. We get part of what we're hoping for, right? the true score, the thing we care about, the thing we're trying to measure. Right? In this case, the ability of a student or the capacity of the student to do the work in the classroom. But we get other stuff with it, too. All measurement has error. It has two, broadly speaking, types of error. It has systematic error, right? regular aspects of how we did the measurement, what we used for the measurement, who did the measurement, things that are specific and recur that can lead to bias, that can lead to different outcomes than if we were measuring the true score with an unbiased measure. And then, uh, so anytime you use a single method or rely heavily on a single method, that increases the vulnerability to systematic error. If you're always using the same method or using a mostly one method, that means that if there's any error in that method built into that measurement, that's going to affect everyone. So anytime you use a single method, it increases the vulnerability. And then there's random error, temporary errors, things that happen at a moment in time. Right? Your car blows a tire on the way to the assessment. My personal experience with a random error influencing one of my exam grades, I was hit by a car on the way to my fluid dynamics final in college. It wasn't very bad. It was only backing out. Right? My bike was wrecked. But I'd left early enough that I could still walk the rest of the way to uh, the exam. And I wasn't really hurt. Right? I had some scrapes, but I, nothing was broken, nothing was sprained. So I didn't have a medical excuse. I talked to the instructors like, well, are you going to go to student health? And like, no, I think I don't really need to. He's like, well, then you have to sit for the exam. So I did. It was the only C I ever got on any exam at any point. K through graduate school. I'd like to argue that that had something to do with being hit by a car and having like little micro demonstrations of fluid dynamics from the little trickles of blood from some of the scrapes. Um, it may not, right? It's a hypothesis. 
But any time you have a single instance measure, right, any time you measure something at a single point of time, that opens up the opportunity for random events to influence that measure. And even a variety of things can come into play. Right? And we generally kind of understand that there's error in our measurement. That's why none of us, at the end of our classes, give a single question exam that summarizes the whole class and give no other work. Right? We give different types of formative and summative assessments throughout the semester to give students multiple different opportunities to demonstrate their capacity. That's how we help avoid the possibility that we're only measuring their capacity in one way that might be biased or by only doing it at one point of time. So if we were to design a better assessment system, right? what if we did this from scratch for the colleges? How would we design it? Well, we'd, what we'd want to do is we'd want to triangulate to the true score to try and avoid the different sources of systematic and random error. What, might, what types of things would we try and vary? Well, we'd try and use different types of assessment. We wouldn't rely on a single method of assessment. We'd use a variety of different assessments, maybe some designed, maybe some produced by outside vendors. Who knows? But we'd probably use more than one. We definitely want to consider different contexts of assessment. Right? One of the things that a lot of colleges are finding is that students perform very differently when they come to a college for the first time than they perform on assessment when you give it to them in their high school in a context with which they're familiar. So uh, one of the things I could tell you as someone who's visited not quite, uh, slightly over 80% of all the community colleges in the system, the signage is bad. There's construction everywhere. Sometimes colleges have buildings named the same thing at different parts of the college. And so when you're going there for the first time as a student, right, you have to navigate all of that and get to your assessment on time. I don't know what your policy is here, but at Long Beach, what we would do is the door would be locked at the time of the start. If you were one second late, you did not get in. Right? So you have this stressful first time experience. You have to navigate all these things. And then you have to take the most important test of your life. Those are context effects, right? When you give the same test to students in an environment with, with, in which they're comfortable and familiar, they do about 7 to 10% better. Content domains. We want to make sure that we're not relying on just a, a very simple set of content, because the content can bring bias with it, too. My favorite example of this comes from a researcher at Fullerton College. He's someone that emigrated here. Uh, as, a, as, a, uh, as a child from the Ukraine, and then went through our you know, system in the state of California with one of his early stops in the California Community College system. And the thing that he remembers quite broadly and, and, and specifically is his experience taking the math assessment. Right? He's a researcher. He's exceptionally good at his job. And the question he got stuck on was he was asked to estimate the weight of a football team. Right? A football team for someone from the Ukraine or literally anywhere else in the world other than the United States is a totally different thing, right? And that type of question assumes cultural knowledge that has nothing to do with your mathematics ability, right? So if we're not careful, our content can bring errors in, and we need to make sure that we're varying that as well. And then time. I already discussed one aspect of time. Random errors can come in. But time can also introduce systematic errors. So from our experience at Long Beach City College, there were two really big times where we would do a lot of our assessment. One of them was uh, immediately after school, so that students who were in high school could come directly from high school to us. It was super convenient for them. But it's worth thinking about what that's like, right? So think about what you're like after a day of classes, or worse, a day of meetings, right? Are you at top form? Are you at peak form? You're, you're ready to go? Probably not. These students have been in class all day. They're probably worn out. And we ask them to, again, take one of the most important tests they'll ever take under those circumstances. In our family, we have a rule that everyone gets five minutes when they get home. right? Five minutes to become a human being again, to kind of like, no one's going to bug you. No one's going to hit you with anything. Everyone's got a chance to put their stuff down, take a breath, do whatever they need to do so we can be civil. We're basically asking students to walk straight out of something that's often very difficult right, into a very important situation. So that's one possible systematic error. The other one is we would also hold these really spectacular big events so we could bring like a whole district's worth of students, right? They would get buses, they would all come together, It'd be like super registration events. But to make that work, to get our staff in place for all the students to be able to come, when would we hold it? 
8 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday, right? I don't know how many of you have, have high school students or have had high school students in, in your family, or who've been a high school student. <laughs> Come on, give me some hands. All right, right? Think about what 8 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday is like for a high school student. I can tell you, I have two teenagers, that time does not exist. As far as they know, it's theoretically a real time, but they are not up you know, voluntarily at that time. And there's a huge amount of developmental uh, psychology work on this that suggests that young adults, right, somewhere from the ages of about 13 to 20, 21, really don't function well in the morning. There's a huge national movement to try and move back to start time of high schools because of how bad students are first thing in the morning. And then you add Saturday morning to that, right? Who knows what a high school student is doing on Friday night, but I can guarantee you it's probably not getting to bed early, right? So that's another thing that well, that's a big time we would assess a lot of our students. That introduces something that has nothing to do with their true score, right? It has nothing to do with their true score. It has a lot to do with how, when it's being measured. So the question is, do we have anything like that? Right? Do we have anything like this in our system? If we did this individually as colleges, it would cost us hundreds of thousands of dollars to set up, right? and tons and tons of money to implement on a regular basis. That's why we've kind of fallen back on something that's relatively easy and convenient, but it's worth thinking about what the structure of this is. right? So you're looking across many different methods of assessment, potentially, across multiple different contexts, across different content domains, and across time. When you think really carefully about what that is, that's essentially what cumulative high school GPA is. Right? Students' cumulative high school GPA is the summary of tens of thousands of formative summative assessments across dozens of different instructors, sometimes multiple different schools, across dozens of different content domains, and across four years of time. Right? If we wanted to design an assessment for us, right, it would cost us hundreds of thousands, not millions of dollars, to duplicate something that's available for free. So do we use it? And the basic answer to that is no. Right? Nationally, right, where other, we have some requirements in California, but nationally only about 27%, just a little over one in four uh, community colleges use something other than a test for placement. And that's changing. right? This is a little bit dated. We don't have a new survey. But basically, most of what we do is we use a test and we adjust around it. Even in California, where it's the law, right? we've had two separate surveys of colleges, one by WestEd in 2011, one by PPIC in 2016, in which we find that colleges do have multiple measures, but they're not really multiple measures. Right? There are multiple measures in which we pretty much have a large test. That is the vast majority of how we do the assessment, and we adjust around that. That's not a holistic comprehensive assessment of student capacity that's using a single method and meaning the letter but not the spirit of the law or what we should be doing in assessment. And what this means is the vast majority of our students are placed below transfer level. Nationally, it's somewhere close to about two-thirds of students take one or more de developmental education courses. In California, it's probably closer to 85%. Right? It's, you know, there are different estimates. If you look at the scorecard, it's closer to 75%. But the scorecard disappears a lot of students that never get counted in your cohort. If you look at some of the old BSI re accountability reports, what you see is a, it's about 85% of students are going to be placed into one or more uh, developmental education sequences. Usually math is the highest, depending a little bit on the college. Um, what does that mean for students? For every level below transfer, the likelihood of completing the transfer level gateway course in the discipline drops between about a third to a half. Right? So every additional level makes it much less likely that those students complete. And it tends to lead to lack of completion in ways that we typically don't understand. Right? Most of the time when we look at that, we typically say, those students weren't successful because they didn't have what it takes. The assessment proves that. Well, it turns out that when you drill down and look at what's happening, that's not actually what students are not failing out of the sequence in the largest number. The single biggest leak point of almost everyone's developmental education sequence is the first one. Once you assign students to dev ed, somewhere around a third of them will never take a single course in the discipline before they leave college. Right? That's the biggest leak point in our dev ed sequences. And then the next cumulative set of leak points is students who succeed 
but don't take the next course, right? So we lose more than half of all of our students who don't fail, who either don't start or succeed and decide that it's taking too long or life gets in the way, whatever the case may be. Another really important thing that's happening here at assessment and placement dovetails pretty powerfully with the equity work that most of us are undergoing right now, or right, have been undergoing for some time. Greg Stop is the, uh, shoot, I think he's the executive director of research and planning for the Contra Costa Community District. He's also the president of the RP group. He's been doing this work in his district for some time. He did a fantastic presentation at the uh, Strengthening Student Success Conference in 2015 is working on a paper. But what he did for his district is try and figure out where those equity gaps in our outcomes are coming from. Tracking students all the way through their journey. So starting from what your community looks like and then what the students who apply to your institution look like. Right? And what he finds is there's not much difference. Right? They tend to be a little bit younger overall, but typically they match pretty well. And then he tracks these students all the way through. How do they assess and place? How many units do they take in their first semester? Right? What courses do they take in their first semester? How successful are they, they in those courses? How many students persist to semester two? Right? And how do they do? What's their first year GPA? How many of them end up um, making significant academic progress or not? Right? How many persist to year two? How many enter programs? How many are successful across a wide number of units? How many hit 30 successfully completed units all the way out to which of our students are successfully completing a certificate, a degree, or transferring to a four-year institution. All right, so he tracks them all the way through the journey. And his question is, we have all these equity gaps at the end, right? huge, massive equity gaps in which students are most likely to complete uh, meaningful educational outcomes. And what he wants to know is, where do they appear in this journey? Right? Where do the equity gaps loom largest? And what he finds is more than half of the equity gaps that we see at the end are already in place at the end of assessment and matriculation. Right? More than half of the gaps we see in our outcomes are already in place before students set foot in their first classroom at our colleges. So if we meaningfully want to close those gaps, we have to look very carefully at what's happening at the front door of our colleges because a lot of what's happening in our equity gaps are happening there. And if we can, sp we can spend thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars after that point, but we're going to be swimming upstream against things that are already in place. I put my clicker down by accident, sorry. All right, the conventional wisdom explaining these results typically resolves, uh, revolves around a couple of different explanations. One of the most common is it's something with today's students. Students today are just not as serious as we were. They are totally you know, immersed in their digital devices. I'm getting papers with emojis in them and leet speak. Right? They can't do work without a calculator. Right? We have all kinds of explanations for how students today just basically suck right? in a variety of ways. Right? I mean, that's, I, I don't want to sugarcoat it. That's functionally what we say. It's something about the students we're getting in college that they just can't do the work. Right? Sometimes they'll say it's not the student's fault. It's a problem with public education. Right? It just kind of moves the causality back a little bit. But it, it strikes me. And I have to say, this argument resonated with me a lot when I was an instructor um, until I started to think about what it was like when I was a young adult, right? When I came out of high school and I faced articles in Time and Newsweek about how I was the suckiest generation in the history of America, right? Generation X, we were so lost. We were the first people called boomerang kids, right, that went to college and came back because they didn't know what to do. This is one of my favorite phrases of all times, right? If, uh, this is referring to Generation X. If these pusillanimous purveyors of pseudo-angst would put as much effort into getting a life as they do into writing about their horrible fate, we'd be spared the weekly diatribes that pass for reasoned argument, right? People talked all kinds of crazy smack about how we were terrible. Right? You had articles talking about like, the slouching towards educational Gomorrah. Right? And this is how you know, the baby boomers used to talk about us. We don't know what to do with these students. They can't do the work. They're not independent. They have all these problems. They're coming to us in ways that they just don't have the independence that we did. Which on reflection is a little bit weird for baby boomers to say. 
right? Because before they were called baby boomers, they were called the hippies. And there were Broadway musical songs about how that generation of kids were so messed up and not together and on drugs and couldn't do anything right. So at the very least, we should show some hesitation in suggesting that there's something specially wrong about this crop of young adults when this is basically what older adults say about young adults generation after generation. So let's look at the evidence, right? Is it true that students today are much worse at things than they were when we were kids? And you really, if any of you have worked on, on projects with your kids, I think you'll pretty quickly realize that that can't possibly be true, right? So let me just give you one example. Uh, my youngest daughter, she's in eighth grade now, but her fourth grade project, right, her end of the year project for her class um, was, well, wait, let me first describe my end of the year project in my fourth grade class, right? I, was, I had to go get two original sources, right? I had to draw my own picture about any subject. I chose the Kit Fox, it was cute, right? I had to write original, I had to do a draft, submit it, revise it, and then put it all on poster and display it. Got an A+, plus, super proud of it. My mom still has it in a box someplace in our attic. Right? It was a great project. My daughter's fourth grade project, end of the year. So one of the things they were covering was history of our city, Fullerton. So their job was to go all over town and take pictures of historic monuments, right? things that are tied to the history of the city of Fullerton, they had to research those monuments and the people that they were linked to. So they had to get the history of both the monument and the people. Then they had to describe those monuments. They had to create a script that would link those monuments in temporal order across time using the voices of people of those eras. Right? Then they had to create a digital avatar that looked like them, read the script, put it to uh, era-appropriate music, and tape it as a video, and put all those pieces together, and upload it to YouTube so the class could do it and share it as the end of the year project for everyone. Right? That's my daughter's fourth year project compared to my nice little two-page display on the Kit Fox. Right? You, it's hard to argue, right? It's public school that they walk to. It's hard to argue that our students aren't engaging in much more complex things, much, at much greater exposure than many of us ever had to information, to different techniques of understanding information and putting it together. So there's other evidence. If you look uh, broadly speaking, there's this phenomenon in the study of IQ called the Flynn effect. Right? Uh, what happens when you measure IQs is a lot of IQ tests are normed. Right? So they're set so that the population average is set to be a particular score, often something like 100. So if you have a score of 100, you're average. If you're above 100, you're above average. And if you're below 100, you're below average, right? Well, we have to renorm IQ tests every five to seven years because as a population, we keep getting smarter. The average performance of the population IQ test goes up over time. If we gave everyone in this room an IQ test, a typical IQ test from World War II, every single one of you would be super geniuses, right? The War Department would be lined up outside to recruit you directly into the effort to fight the Nazis because of how brilliant we all are compared to people of that era. It's just not the case that people in general are less smart or less together. If you look at young adults with a high school degree, it's the, ever, it's the highest it's ever been in the history of the United States. And I have to update this every year. Last year was 92.4, right? It's not the case that students are getting less education. In general, we're getting more education. Students are getting further. They're staying longer in education than ever before. If you look at the National Assessment of Educational Progress, it's sometimes referred to as the nation's report card, right? They do a nice stratified random sample across the entire United States trying to make sure that they get students from every different demographic group, from every different type of location, every state, rural, urban, suburban, exurban, all those different things. And when they look across all of these different measures, measuring students' performance on reading and math, it did go down a little bit in this last year, but we remain at or above all-time highs in virtually every demographic category in both math and reading for every age group. There's a little bit of evidence of some leveling out in reading, 
Um, and you can see more information if you want to look at them. They, they keep all of this publicly available. So 17-year-old white kids, probably their reading scores haven't improved very much over the last two decades. But it's not the case that they're getting worse. And it is the case that virtually at every other age for every other demographic group, students are getting better. They're smarter, they know more, they can do more than they ever could before. And what about evidence from our colleges, right? Do the standardized tests that we use to measure student capacity measure that student capacity well? They don't, right? The evidence on this has been, become really, really strikingly strong. And it's worth just kind of thinking about what that means for a second before I cover it. Assessment tests have one job, right? You know, you have your students that have the one job meme, right? You had one job and they show something done ter terribly wrong. Assessment tests have one job, to figure out the capacity of our students and get them in the right course. And they don't actually predict how students perform in our courses very well. So what you see across a wide variety of work, I've just got a couple summarized here, um, that, but there's a lot more that the CCRC has available. What you see again and again is that standardized tests actually are pretty poor predictors of students' performance in English and math. They're just not that strongly correlated with how they do. They are correlated. So if you don't have anything else, of course you'd use it, right? Anything that helps us better understand the capacity, even something that's poorly correlated, we would use, right? So in the absence of other things, we would still continue to use this. But right now, they just really aren't very strong predictors. And when we go back and look at all these students that were using these tests to place into developmental education, what you see quite readily is that a very large proportion of those students are severely underplaced. Not just underplaced, severely underplaced. Students who could get a B or better in a transfer level course who are placed into developmental education. Depending on the system, what you see is it's somewhere between about two fifths to almost a third of students are severely underplaced. As many as 50% are underplaced who could successfully complete the course. Right? So we have a large number of students who are actually being placed far below the work that they're capable of doing. I just want to give you a couple of flavors of this. This comes from some work from Bad Brossi, and this uh, comes from uh, actually this work by Belfield and Cross in 2012 on the North Carolina system. So one of, the, one of the things that they did as part of that research is look at the relationship between different subcomponents of the various tests being used throughout North Carolina, the Accuplacer test, the ACID test, and the Compass test. And I, I don't know if you guys watched as much Sesame Street as I did when I was a kid, but one of the things they had was this game called One of These Things is Not Like the Others, right? And so there would always be this little song. There would be these three things that were similar and one obvious different thing, right? One of these things is not like the others. Across all these different tests, and again, this is their one job, is to be able to predict how students are going to do in your classes, high school GPA, free is better than all of these, than any of them. And you might notice that a couple of them are negatively correlated, right? Doing better on the test is correlated with slightly worse performance in the class. That's not what you want out of an assessment instrument. Um, what typically happens is I, as I go around the state and various other states as well to talk about this, almost everywhere I go, I hear the same thing, right? Oh, that's all well and good. Right? I understand, I get this, but I just have to tell you my students are different. The students at our college are different. Our college curriculum is different. This can't work for our college. The first thing I have to say to that is not all of you can be right. right? Probabilistically, that can be true for one or two of you, but it can't be the case that you all have the students for whom this doesn't work. So I'm just going to give you one very big outlier example as a, as a state who said this stuff can't possibly apply to us, and that's Alaska. The state of Alaska said all of those things. We have very large rural populations. We have some basically you know, one K through 12 building schools where students stay with the same teachers their entire career. We have very far flung native populations that have very different educational experiences. And we have a system in which we have two year and four year students together. It's totally different than anywhere else. This can't possibly apply to us. Michelle Dara and her colleagues at um, uh, Regional Education Northwest said, okay, let's check. And so they have students' performance on the SAT, the ACT, and Accuplacer, 
um, for both in black associate's degree students and bachelor's degree students predicting performance in English compared to high school GPA. Right? Students' cumulative high school GPA remains a far stronger predictor of student performance for both two and four year students, regardless of which of these tests they use to get in, similar pattern for mathematics. Right? It's just very reliably the case that students' high school GPA is a very, very strong predictor of their performance in subsequent academic environments. So it gets worse, right? That sounds pretty bad so far. We're getting to the, kind of the bottom of the presentation. Another thing that the research strongly suggests is that community college students, broadly speaking, and the types of students we serve in community colleges are most underserved by these methods. So if we go back to that Fields of Parsad's paper where they did a national review of assessment, um, uh, assessments being used everywhere and what cut scores are, things like that. And the first thing they found, very broadly speaking, was there's this enormous variability, right, in what, where cut scores are set. And one of the things that I've been super surprised to see as I've gone around the state is there's enormous variability within the same district of where they set cut scores, which should really concern us, right? If college readiness is this thing, if readiness for a particular course is this thing, the fact that our colleagues at the institution next door in the same district as us have these really strong disagreements with us, that should give us some pause about what's happening. But the other thing that Fields and Parcel have found is that two-year colleges in general had higher cut scores than four-year colleges. We hold our students to a higher readiness standard than four-year colleges do. And I guarantee you there aren't people in rooms like this uh, at four-year colleges right next door sitting around going, oh, why are we not as rigorous as our community college colleagues down the road? That's just not happening. Oh, and the other thing is, in addition to using higher cut scores, we are also much more likely to take students who are moderately or highly prepared Right, students who did better in high school, 2.5 or better overall is, is the cutoff for moderate, scored above average on the SAT, got further in mathematics in high school, we're much more likely to assign those students to dev ed than uh, four-year colleges are. And then when you drill down further and you look at particular types of students that were particularly likely to say, serve at the California community colleges, students of color, first-generation college students, low-income students, uh, and in mathematics women, what you see is these tests are actually even worse predictors of student performance in our classes and our colleges. And so the types of students we're most likely to serve typically are the most underserved or poorly measured by these types of instruments. <clears throat> Going back to multiple measures more generally, one of the consequences of all of this is that there's a real emerging consensus that we should be doing this more, that this should be a foundation of how we do assessment and placement. And there's a couple of recent guides that go over that one to how to build assessments of college readiness uh, that basically uses the technique, or it highlights the technique that we use at both Long Beach and the technique we use in the multiple measures assessment project that things that everyone should be doing. And then the educator's practice guide to strategies for post-secondary students in development education. I highly recommend both of these sources. They're very easy to read. They basically say, listen, this is best practice in assessment. This is what we should be doing. And it's relatively straightforward to do under the right circumstances and any college should be able to do it. <clears throat> the other thing that's always worth mentioning is that's actually required, right? Uh, there's been plenty of places I go where people actually have lost track of this fact. We're supposed to be doing this, right? And not just because they made up some rule. We're supposed to be doing this because our assessment and placement methodology was discriminating against certain types of students in the state, and we were sued because of how poor of a practice this is, right? And so we are supposed to be using multiple measures. It's all over the matriculation and triple SP handbook. Assessment, and this is true, is a holistic process through which each college collects information to facilitate their success. Assessments should reflect a variety of informational sources. Colleges must adhere, must be based on multiple measures. Additional ed indicators must be used. Right? These are not kind of like, if you want, adjust around the margins. That's not what we're being told to do, right? Multiple measures are required performance. One of the things that does come up, and so it's worth underscoring this, is part of any of our uh, colleges is making sure that the processes that we put in place don't create um, disproportionate impact, right? That aren't impacting certain types of students differently. And if you look across the state, virtually every college 
has demonstrable disproportionate impact in assessment and placement. African Americans, Hispanics, low income students, very much disproportionately likely to be placed lower down in developmental education, more likely to be placed in developmental education more generally. And colleges generally have been able to get a pass on this because of one of the sub kind of descriptions, right? Disproportionate impact, percentage of persons of a particular racial, ethnic, gender, age, or disability group directed to a particular service or course placement, et cetera. It's significantly different from the representation of that group, and that discrepancy is not justified by empirical evidence. So what most of us have said is the empirical evidence of these test scores means that we're off the hook for disproportionate impact, right? The test scores suggest that these students can't do the work, and so that's why we're assigning them that that's not disproportionate impact except we just went through a whole variety of research that suggests those aren't actually predictably useful or are far less predictably useful than the way we use them. So ultimately what that means is we're using something where the empirical evidence is, does not justify that. And so we're much more on the hook for taking care of the disproportionate impact that we're generating because those measures are not valid and reliable predictors of performance in the relevant educational setting. They're just not. Uh, and then the other thing that people also will bring up is various things about prerequisites and co-requisites. There are a variety of different things that allow us to establish prerequisites in our courses, right? It's a danger to students, it's required by law. But one of the key things that we typically use is that the prerequisite will ensure that a student who has not met that prerequisite is highly unlikely to succeed in the course. Not slightly more unlikely, not somewhat unlikely, highly unlikely. Right? And you're seeing this kind of language come out. We have to be prepared for addressing this because we are putting students into developmental education that are far more than highly unlikely to be able to complete transfer level coursework or higher level courses in developmental education. So all of that brings us to the point of possibility. Right? We've spent a lot of time assigning many, many of our students into developmental education out of concerns that those students just don't have what it takes to do well at our colleges, that they may not be college material or maybe not college level material. But what if part of the problem has not been with the student's capacity, but it's, when it's been with how we've assessed their capacity, how we've understood that capacity, the amount of actual work that we've put in to knowing what our students can actually do. And so part of what's happening with the multiple measures of assessment project statewide as we're working with organizations all over the state to basically take from CalPASS Plus, it's the voluntary intersegmental educational data system for the state of California, it has all the community colleges in it. It's got about 75% of the K-12 districts, though they drop in and out because it's voluntary. Um, and we use that data to track students from high school to community colleges and see how they do, right? And so we approach this in a very agnostic way Right, to look at anything we can pull out of students' high school records that helps us to identify uh, and validate multiple measures data. So we've looked at high school achievement. We've worked with colleges to try and identify additional non-cognitive variables. Uh, we've looked at self-reported high school achievement. We'll have some more information on that coming out later this year. Uh, we've also looked at things like delay, how long it's been since you've been in high school, all of those types of variables, both in the data and derived. And what we do very specifically is focus on what predicts how students do in our courses, right? That's what we want to know. How are students going to do in our courses so we can get them in the right one? We use a very conservative criterion rate for transfer level courses, 70% success, right? That's about the average success rate for transfer level English across the state. It varies a little bit by institution. It's a little bit higher than the average transfer level success rate in math. But we didn't want the mathematics faculty to say, you guys are using a lower standard for our students than the English we didn't want to have anything like that, right? Everyone gets the same standard. So we're using a relatively conservative standard. Uh, and you can see all of the rules that we develop based on this. We use uh, a data mining technique to try and look at which types of students are most likely to succeed across the various courses in English and mathematics, as well as reading in ESL across the state. Um, and then we work with pilot colleges to check, right? Some of them have done local replications of the research. Like, we have to check to make sure that we are not a totally different special situation, so we're going to conduct research on our institution ourselves. And they've set up slightly different rules. Kenyatta College and the Peralta Colleges are examples of this. They test the models. They pilot the use and placement. They provide us feedback. We have lots of ongoing resources 
webinars. Um, we have uh, in-person convenings at least once a year. Uh, we provide all kinds of free resources at the main page of the project that's available for anyone. Right? So we try and be as transparent and open as possible and work with everyone together to try and move this forward. So to give you kind of a sense of what we see in the data, right? this is our historic placement rates in English and math. This is if you look at things like the BSI reports. About 28% of students statewide were placed into transfer level English, about 15% in transfer level math. One of the things that we see in the data, right, if we look at students based on what courses they took first, you see a slightly different pattern, right? That students are more likely to start at a transfer level English or math courses with the first course you take, right? That's another piece of evidence that points to where we're losing a lot of students, right? The fact that there's a higher proportion of students with course taking at the transfer level than there is in placement suggests that students placed in developmental education are disproportionately likely not to take that course, right? To not start in the discipline. And then when we look at which students are likely to succeed, what we typically see is something around two-thirds of students who have high school information are likely to successfully complete transfer level English using the types of rules we developed. Very basically, students who are B minus or better students in high school typically likely to succeed in a transfer level English course. In mathematics, it's a little bit not, or it's not as steep. Um, mathematics is a much more sequenced set of courses uh, and students and districts have much more flexibility in how far students go in mathematics. Most students get at least three or four years of English in high school, but students often can stop after two years of mathematics. And just to give you an example from Long Beach, before we started our work on the Promise Pathways, the requirement for graduation in mathematics at Long Beach Unified was students had to take two years of mathematics, not pass, not complete. They had to be in the class for two years, and they had to pass algebra with a D. That was the math requirement for graduation before we started, right? And then there are other districts that have far more requirements. And so students have a broader set of where they land in mathematics than they do in English. But still, many more of them can successfully complete transfer level math than uh, currently getting access to it. And then we did, for every one of these students, for every one of these students, we found other students in the system that had the same attributes of them, right, had the same, got the, to the same course, had the same grades, had the same California standards test results to, uh, that got into transfer level mathematics someplace in the system, right? One of the nice things about being able to do this work system-wide that you don't have access to as a college, because we all have variation in cut scores, we have students that are getting in with very different criteria at different places, so that allows us to find students like these students everywhere and when we look at their likelihood success rates, what we find is that they should be pretty similar to the students that we already have in our courses right now. Right? That is, they're not less qualified. They're just demonstrating their capacity in ways that we're not picking up in our measurement or assessment. So the first thing that people always say when they see this is, well, sure, you can let more students in, but you're just letting less successful students in, and they're more likely to fail. Right, this is a return to the right to fail model. And it turns out that that's not the case. What we typically find is that students are just as likely, if not more likely, to be successful. In English, it's almost always the case that students are slightly more likely. In math, it varies, varies a little bit more around um, equal to slightly less. Here's a couple early examples from our work at Long Beach uh, and Sierra College, which was one of the early adopters to the Student Transcript Enhanced Placement Study. Um, for us, what we found is that students who were placed using the alternative method, took transfer level English, had success rates that were higher than students in the same courses with the same instructors at the same time uh, across our entire curriculum. So they were, did better than students who tested in. They also did better than students that had tested lower and had persisted across multiple semesters at our college to make it to transfer level English. And in mathematics, the success rates were the same. At Sierra College, students could get in via AccuPlacer plus you know, our typical multiple measures. And then in fall 2014, they allow students to get in by their high school transcript data. They set up their own algorithm that they developed locally. But basically, it's somewhere in the kind of students with a B or better, plus or minus some different attributes of like if you had a higher score in your last, a higher grade in your last English course, you could get in with a lower GPA, those types of things. And what they found is those students were not actually less likely to be successful, they're more likely to be successful. 
This is not about identifying students who are marginally prepared, who are less prepared. This is identifying students who are prepared, who did the work semester after semester in high school, course after course, in every academic environment they were, and when they come to our academic environment, guess what? They continue to do the work. Uh, Kenyatta College that I mentioned earlier, they developed their own algorithm. They ran their own research. Uh, this comes from their presentation uh, to other pilot colleges on a webinar. They increased their placement into transfer level math by about 25%, doubled their placement into transfer level English. And their success rates for those students, virtually identical. A little bit higher in math, a little bit lower in English, neither one of those significantly different. So they're letting many more students in, students that we wouldn't have let often get to those courses for additional semesters, and they're doing just as well as students who got there via the normal methods. Miracosta is this great example of a college that caught the fever and decided they wanted to do this right away. So uh, I went down, I think I probably told you guys this story the last time I was here. Uh, I'm not sure how far along they were at that point. Um, but I went down and talked to them the Friday before Thanksgiving, right, in fall 2015. All right, it's kind of a busy time of year. You're starting to ramp up for applications for, you have know, spring applications, you're setting up spring registration, you have fall applications and assessments that are coming online, and everyone's dispersing for the holidays, and you have the exams during that period too. So I went down, talked to the English department, talked to the math department, talked to their student success committee. Right? They basically had me for the whole day. And we just talked, uh, answered any questions they had, and went and went and went. And the English department stayed for an additional two hours on a Friday afternoon on the I-5 corridor. Right? I don't know how many of you have tried to drive between San Diego and Los Angeles on a Friday afternoon. No one stays. Right? I've been in other presentations where, like, as soon as you get to about 2 o'clock, like, people just, every time you turn around, there's five less people in the room. <laughs> right? They stayed an extra, I think, hour and a half to talk this through as a department, voted that they wanted to implement this. They had another set of department votes over the next three days to work with the Triple SP. And by the Tuesday before Thanksgiving, they had worked it out with the Triple SP personnel that they were going to change to use self-reported high school grades. They were already collecting it for students who had a 3.0 or greater or a 2.5 or greater and an A or B in their last English. And they chose that because they were only asking GPA in these incremental ways. They like, was your GPA between 3.5 and, uh, 2 and 3 and 3.5? And 3 they didn't have it collectively. Otherwise, they probably would have used that. And so they used this as a proxy. So what they did is they have students basically then, they had already started assessing students, and they have students that happened before this change and students that got the assessment after this change. They were already placing a lot of students into transfer level English, so they're not always the best comparison. But it does tell you that even places that are putting tons of students into transfer level English, unlike folks like us at Long Beach and other places, right, there's room to move. So their overall mean of placement in transfer level English before was 62%. <clears throat> the highest performing group, uh, wait, why did I, I think that line was supposed to be at 62%, sorry, I'm not sure how it ended up at 65%, it might have been the switch to this machine. But every single group is basically at or above the overall average. This helps everyone. Everyone is being placed higher across all the demographic groups, and the equity gaps are narrowed. And then when you look at the outcomes, here are students in spring and fall 2016 that were assessed under the old method. Their success rates in transfer level English, 65 to 68%. Students in the same courses, same instructors, different placement methods, those students were slightly more likely to be successful. Right? This is identifying students who have succeeded in their academic context before and succeed in their academic context when given the opportunity. Las Positas is a more recent example. They started this in 2016. Uh, like Miracosta, they decided to use self-reported high school GPA. And the reason for that is some places have districts that just don't participate in CalPASS and aren't willing to do local data sharing agreements. So it can be hard to get student transcript data easily. So after a year or two of talking about it, they decided they just wanted to move forward. And they used student, uh, student self-reported high school GPA greater than 2.5 within 10 years of high school. Right? They doubled the percentage, more than doubled the percentage of students led into transfer level English and their success rates stayed the same. If anything, the students who got in via the multiple measures alone, this group of students who had previously been kept out of transfer level English were slightly more successful than previously. Uh, one of the things that they did 
uh, that uh, not every college has done. I like to pull this out because they're one of the examples of this, them and IBC. They also asked the faculty and the students whether or not they were ready. Faculty range of preparation. Basically, uh, the plurality of, a plurality of faculty said they were equally prepared or moderately more prepared. Right? More faculty said that students were more prepared with students being let in at a far greater rate than said students were less prepared. Some did, but on balance, they were either equally or more prepared in, in the range of the faculty. And when you look at students' judgments about whether or not they were uh, whether or not the reading and writing in the course was at the right level, too difficult or too easy, the vast majority of them said this was right for me. Uh, Irvine Valley, I'm not going to get into their methods. They use kind of an opportunistic type of way to launch their multiple measures assessment. But basically those students who got in via the multiple measures were just as likely to be successful. Their drop rate was maybe a little bit higher, but their success rate more than made up for it. The withdrawal rate was lower and the failure rate was lower. And then when you look at both student and faculty, were you placed in the correct course? The vast majority of both students and faculty said yes. Uh, and then they actually had a couple of other questions of the faculty. Did the students put in too little effort or did they put in considerable positive effort? And students were accused of, or accused, students in not getting in via multiple measures were more likely to be rated as putting in too little effort in the course. Uh, Southwestern College uh, is another example that used self-report and they're a college that had some concerns about their initial implementation and how it worked out, partly because some of their success rates weren't as high as they were hoping for. So this, they were already using some relatively robust multiple measures, and they used, again, a slightly more liberal entry than we did in the multiple measures assessment project using 2.5. Oops. <clears throat> and so what they found is that students who got in via the multiple measures assessment project rules alone, this rule, were slightly less successful than students who got in via both methods combined. So a student who would get in via multiple measures and the test. But when they compared that to students who weren't very good in high school but got in via the test, those students were about equally successful. Right? And their overall success rates was about 70%. But one of the things we're targeting in multiple measures is we're not just targeting these students. We're trying to identify students regardless of the test that are likely to be successful. So students had about a 70% 70, 70 success rate when you combine these two groups. <clears throat> but that wasn't enough, right? They're really concerned that we're, that's, that's pretty low even compared to these other two groups. What does that mean? So they went back and looked at two different measures. The success rates of students taking transfer level English if attempted who had started normally at one level below. Most of their students are assigned one level below in English if they're not assigned a transfer level. So of students who start one level below, their success rates in transfer level English is not quite as high as these overall success rates as students who went there directly, but pretty high, about 65%. And the math students are succeeding at about the same rate, a little bit lower. So that helped them feel a little bit better about it. But this is where they felt totally different about it. Right? They looked at the percentage of students who started below transfer level, how many of them successfully completed the transfer level English course. Right? Even with these success rates, these are of the students that attempt, that make it there. Of students, of the entire set of students assigned one level below, only about one quarter make it successfully through transfer level English within two to three years. And only about 10% make it within the first year. That basically take it, succeed, and take the next level. These same students, given access to the transfer level course based on their performance in high school, become much more likely to complete that course, right? Much more likely to successfully navigate to the end of the gateway course. In math, again, some concern, some drop off for them. Part of the problem is they had so few students that tested in. This represents only 20 students total that test in the transfer level mathematics at Southwest. And so they were concerned, given they're letting students in who had a somewhat lower success rate. Not surprisingly. One of the things that we found is that uh, a challenge that some colleges have that doesn't work that well with the MAP rules is they had a very large transfer level entry bucket. What, what I mean by that? That means if you get access to transfer level, you can take statistics, you can take liberal arts mathematics courses like math for elementary educators, you can take college algebra, or you can take trigonometry. And if you look at how our rules are developed in the system, in, in the multiple measures assessment project, we have different rules for each one of those courses. 
the rules to get into trigonometry are much tighter and more difficult than the rules to get into statistics. But what happened is, because they had this single bucket, they basically let everyone who got into statistics to take, they were allowed to take any one of those courses. Right? So students who got in via the statistics route could take the trigonometry class, and those students in particular were not likely to be successful. But then they did the same thing. Of students placed below mathematics at the various levels that are being picked up, one, two, and three levels below, what's their success rates of in transfer level math if they attempt it? Actually pretty low, surprisingly. This is one of the lowest sets I've seen across the course. About one third of students were successfully completing the transfer level math course if they took it after starting at each of these levels. Of the students in the multiple measures group, they were, succeed they were successfully completing it at a higher rate. So their success on the first try taking just transfer level math was higher than the success rates of students who had gone through the developmental sequence there. And again, if you look at the cohort completion rate of students who start one, two, and three levels below, students who would have been assigned to one of those groups much more likely to actually successfully complete the transfer level math class. Uh, and then we have some examples of colleges that have done this at scale outside, the, uh, outside of the United States, outside of California. They typically use pretty simple rules to do these types of things at scale. Ivy Tech is the statewide system in Indiana. Um, they use a very simple rule based on the work of the, uh, the uh, CCRC in North Carolina. Uh, and again, it's the same type of thing. Students that are basically B minus or better are allowed access to transfer level coursework, what they call college level coursework, but they could still get in via the test. And what they found is students that got there via their high school performance, not less likely to be successful, actually more likely. And Davidson County, they were one of the early adopters in North Carolina. Most of the rest of the state is coming online now. Uh, and they use a slightly more rigorous rule, 2.6, and you had to be college directed. What did they mean by that? Well, you could use a lot of things. They just used a proxy of how far you got in mathematics. You had to get past intermediate algebra to show that you were directed towards college. But they used that for both English and math, as reading as, excuse me, as well. And students that are demonstrating that type of pattern in high school, much more likely to be successful than students that were normally assessed in. You're using the methods that they always use. <clears throat> and then one last example from Kuimaka College. And the, the, the thing that's interesting about Kuimaka College, and there's a, there's a new report out on their work that just came out, I think, last week, is that they actually put together a lot of things all at once. Right? They thought differently about how they taught mathematics, and then they combined the use of multiple measures and placement with co-requisite supports for their classes right? across the curriculum. And so basically what happens is, if you have Algebra 2 with a C or better and a high school GPA of 2.8, that's pretty close to some of the rules that we have in place. Um, you can get into any uh, of the entry level, transfer level courses. So that's basically, I think, uh, pre-calculus or trigonometry for the, uh, actually, I don't think they have a, a trig. I think it's just pre-calculus. So you can get in with support. If you have Algebra 1 with a C or better in that, you can get into statistics with support or pre-statistics for some courses. As of this spring, they're working to make it so that every student is eligible to take statistics with support, regardless of where you start. That, that's their goal. Um, and then if you are in STEM and you need to go in a particular STEM pathway and you're not ready, you don't want to take statistics, you can take intermediate algebra with or without support, depending on how well you did. And then uh, AccuPlace will continue to be used for higher placement than these rules. And so right away, they get a very different pattern of placement for students. So this is their previous placement in transfer level math in 2015. About one quarter of students are placed in the transfer level math. With this new method, almost two thirds of students are eligible for transfer level math in what they call the business STEM. So either business calculus, uh, pre-calculus, calculus, or any of those things that are on a STEM track. Or at statistics, they've raised it to 84%, with or without support. So that's students who can have direct access to transfer level courses. And they looked at the success rates of these students, right? Students who are taking the transfer level math courses with support, they wouldn't have previously been eligible for that course, right? What are their success rates for students who would have, uh, some of them would have previously been eligible, but maybe they're moving from like a statistics to a pre-calculus. But the students one level below, two levels below are now taking a transfer level math course. And their success rates in those courses are pretty good. They're a little bit lower three levels below, it's true. Right, students who would have been down in uh, three levels below pre-algebra, right, 
who, by how they did in high school or with the appropriate support, they can only, or they're only currently succeeding with a 56% rate. But if you look at how many of those students completed transfer level math in the past, hardly any of those students completed transfer level math. Most of them never sniffed transfer level mathematics. Right? They weren't even, they weren't, they didn't get close to it for the most part. And even at one level below, that's almost doubling the percentage of students who are successfully completing the gateway transfer level math course in one of the disciplines. Uh, they also broke this down by ethnic group. Uh, again, you have some concerns about lower success rates in these transfer level math courses with support for African Americans, but that's way more students that are getting through, way more African Americans who are successfully completing transfer level math than previously, right? That is an enormous difference in the completion of one of the things that is a very powerful predictor of whether or not a student's ever going to complete a degree, a certificate, or a transfer. Right? If students get that far, their possibilities open up for where they can go afterwards. Uh, and then they just compared the first time students with support versus the students who got directly into those courses. And the students that wouldn't have been eligible but are there with some support are just as likely, if not more likely, to be successful. So it's about identifying for them many more students who can take those courses, as well as how better to support those students to make sure they can complete them on the first try. A couple of other things to cover, because people always ask these questions. How long is high school GPA good for? Most people think, well, I get that you can use this for students who matriculate directly, or maybe within a year or so. But after that, is it really that meaningful? Well, it's worth thinking about what's in high school GPA, and it's worth thinking about how assessment works, right? <clears throat> high school GPA is measuring the consistency and reliability of students' performance over four consecutive years, right? When we use an assessment test, we're measuring that student's ability to do that on that method at that moment in time. If that's all we care about is how students do on a standardized test, that might be okay. But what we're interested in is how students do in a classroom. And it tends not to be a very good predictor. So when we look at how well high school, just high school GPA, predicts student performance in English classes over time, this is by primary terms elapsed since high school graduation. So we have enough data we can be pretty confident out to about nine years. Right? It starts to get a little bit wonky after that. This is the actual term by term, and this is the estimated relationship. Right? You can see there is a drop off initially, right? as students get a little further from high school, it gets a little less predictive, but it remains pretty predictive and more predictive than the standardized test that students take when they walk in the door of the college. Right? So it's true, right? it becomes less useful, but it's still better than the test that we use to predict students' performance. In math, because the math, oh, sorry, this was math, sorry. Math is a, so strike that, this is the math graph. Math does a little bit better overall at predicting performance. The English graph is even more stark, right? Even as you get all the way out to 10 years, there's still a big difference between, in predicting student English performance. So predicting students' performance, high school GPA, nine to 10 years out, is still as good as, as if not better, than the test that we use when students walk in the door. Um, people often have concerns about grade inflation or social promotion. Me too. <clears throat> but here's the thing. What does that concern or criticism mean? It means that we think the grades don't mean anything, right? That they're not actually related to student performance. What we're saying is students just get a grade for being there. That means that there's no oomph there. There's no variability there. There's nothing that's meaningfully correlated with student performance. That's what that hypothesis means. But that's not at all consistent with the evidence. Right? What the ever that would suggest that you get no predictive utility out of high school grades. It would make it worse. But high school grades are still doing a better job of predicting student performance than the tests. So if we're concerned that things like grade inflation and social promotion are making the predictive utility of, of high school GPA less good, we should be con more concerned about the tests we're using that don't do as well. Right? We continue to, predict, uh, to observe strong predictive utility and better than the tests we're using. So I agree. It would be great if we had less grade inflation in high schools, and it would be great if we had less social promotion. But high school grades in that context are still doing better than the other instruments that we use. <clears throat> and then a self-reported high school GPA. You can see a lot of colleges have been using that. I've given you some examples of that. It's worth thinking about UC, CSU. They use self-report. 
data that students report um, unofficial grades when they apply. And what the, the institutions say is, listen, we're going to admit you based on this, and if we admit you, we'll check. And then when they check, one of the, there's a great little piece on this in 2008 when they went in and checked students' uh, self-reported grades. They found that no campus had more than five students that had fudged their grades. Right? We're probably not going to get reliability like that, but that's the type of thing that's led a lot of institutions across the country to use self-reported information and then just check on it. When folks like the College Board and the ACT have looked at this, what they typically find is that students self-reported grades and their actual grades tend to be highly correlated, but not perfectly. Um, but surprisingly, one of the things they find is that there's actually some under-reporting. Right? So amongst students that we're usually talking about students that might be moved into transfer level, Right? Those students aren't over-reporting their GPA. If anything, on average, they're slightly under-reporting their GPA. They're relatively accurate. And then for the students that we're getting that are a little bit less good, right? maybe less prepared, less conscientious in high school, there's a little bit of kind of viewing the past through some rose-colored glasses. Right? I wasn't really a C-minus student. I was more of a C student in high school. So you kind of conveniently drop the minus. If you're down even lower, I wasn't a D, I was more of a C minus. Right? But these students aren't turning themselves largely into A students. And one of the things that's worth keeping, uh, uh, keeping in mind here is we're assuming that the error here is because the students are misremembering. But there are other ways that this could be different. Right? So one of the things that happens is when we get grade data from institutions, they give us all of their grades. And if a student has retaken a course, that course may have replaced their grade. So in the student's mind, that GPA may in fact be higher. If they got a D in algebra and they retook it the next year and got an A, they're told that their GPA is X, but we get both the D and the A when we look at their GPAs. Right? So it may not all be on the student's misremembering. Uh, when the College Board looked at it, what they found is that underreporting for a lot of students was about twice as likely as overreporting. Right? I'm assuming that we're going to have some overreporting. But what we have is an opportunity to basically rethink how we think about our students and think about our educational colleagues. And what all of this work typically points to is that we should be doing more to trust them. Right? Fundamentally, what's happened is that this intersegmental scene, we've decided that we can't trust what's happening across that intersegmental scene. We don't know what was taught over there. And so we have to put the burden on the students and we can't even trust them to tell us. We have to force them to prove it through this one particular method, right? a method that we're not necessarily training them for, introducing them to, that's different depending on which college they're going to, that, that hopefully someday the common assessment may make that less true. Um, we'll see. Uh, but basically, we're putting all this burden on the students to prove that the work that they've done was sufficient. It's worth thinking about how we would feel if that happened in a, at a slightly different moment in time. So think about how, how you would feel if your student was in high school, and at the end of every year in high school, they basically decided that we were going to hold back and force to repeat somewhere around two-thirds of students. Right? Every year in high school, at every grade. That's what happens at these scenes. We hold back a huge proportion of students who successfully did the work because we can't possibly trust the work that's going on there. When the four-year colleges do that to us, we get really mad, right? When they don't value the work that we've done, especially when we can point out to them, hey, we're doing this in smaller classroom sizes in which we have closer relationships with the students. We're not teaching mathematics to a lecture hall of three to 500 students. We have 25 to 35 to 40 students that we're teaching at a time. We are doing this in a much more pedagogically appropriate way than many of you are, and yet they look at our work, and we can't, we can't really be sure how well all of your work is going to transfer. So we have to put you through all of this rigorous rigmarole to determine whether or not we're going to accept it. And that's why community college students, on average, lose somewhere between 25 to 40 percent of their credits as they move from, four -year uh, from our colleges to four-year colleges, what people often call credit loss, like the students like fell out of their pocket on the way. Um, the other be potential additional benefits of this are it gives you an opportunity to really rethink what your early alert systems might be. 
right? We've all worked on this at a variety of colleges. We went through many different iterations at Long Beach. How can we help better understand which students are struggling so we can get our interventions to them more quickly? How can we, you know, when they miss their first assignment, when they don't come to class, how can we work with instructors to figure out which students are struggling when? So that as soon as that happens, we can get them to the appropriate student support personnel and make sure that they stay on track. High school GPA, how students perform in high school, is highly predictive of students who are going to do those things, who are going to miss assignments, right? Students who did that in high school, guess what? They're going to do that in your classes too. And so if you have functional interventions that can help with those students, you don't have to wait for them to do bad on their first assignment or their first test or miss some class. You have a method to identify those students in advance and actually start intervening with them before things even go wrong. Um, <clears throat> this also helps the college in these really interesting secondary ways. So for us at Long Beach, one of the things that helped us do is to get a better sense of how effective our different interventions were. So to give you an example, uh, one of the things we spent a lot, a lot of time thinking about and working on is like, how many students should we try and direct to tutoring? How effective are these services are for different students and those types of things? And we'd have different instructors that would play around with requiring it or not, or giving extra credit for it or not. And what we typically found is that students who went to tutoring Right? especially first-time students, were much more likely to be successful than students who didn't. The problem is we didn't necessarily control who went to tutoring. So could it be something about the students who went to tutoring that was different and led them to be more successful? And lo and behold, what we found is that was a big part of what was happening. The students who were B-plus students in high school right, were much more B-plus, A-minus students in high school, much more likely to go to tutoring. But they were likely to be successful anyway. What was happening is our C minus D plus students in high school, the ones that the whole tutor, the tutoring is there for, many of them weren't even taking advantage of it because in the same way they didn't take advantage of resources in high school. Right? So we had something that turned out to be still effective, but not nearly as effective as we thought and not serving students in the way that we were hoping. And we were able to find that because of getting this information and using it more meaningfully in how we evaluated things. It has the potential to re-energize already existing K-12 relationships. So remember when I told you about what the math requirement was at Long Beach Unified School District? Take two years of math, pass algebra with a D. So the first thing we did when we started working on this at Long Beach and we uh, showed them what was going to happen uh, for placement. And they saw what was happening for English and were very excited by that. And they saw what was happening for math and they thought that was great. Um, but also concerned, well, why can't more students be placed higher in mathematics? And so we worked very carefully with them to kind of show what was happening. And what was happening is there was a huge proportion of students who weren't getting past algebra, right? And students who weren't getting past algebra is really hard in our system for them to ever be placed in transfer level. And so they asked us all kinds of different questions like, well, what about students who maybe end up in a career math? What about them? And what about students who take a finite math course and they go geometry and go finite math instead of intermediate algebra? And all these types of questions they asked us. And so we kept telling them, no, what we really need is more students to try and get through intermediate algebra before they come to us. That would be very functional. Um, and so you know, this went back and forth for about a year. And about a year and a half later, they came back to us and said, well, we're going to change our math requirements. Starting the, uh, the next fall, all new students were going to be required to take three years of mathematics. And starting fall 2015, this was forward then, backward looking now, every student was going to be required to take four years of mathematics in high school with a soft goal to get all of them to intermediate algebra. Our math department danced a, a jig in the street practically after that because that's what they had been wanted, that's what they'd been wanting for a very long time, more students to have more mathematics preparation in high school. How did we get there? We got there because we actually started honoring the work of the high school faculty, right? We got there by restoring that relationship, by not taking 95% of all their students and placing them back into the dev ed to say, actually, it matters how much math you do in high school. It matters how well they do in math in high school. And so the math faculty there and the administration there was like, well, let's then honor that and actually get more students, more mathematics preparation. We got there by validating the work of our educational colleagues not by constantly telling them you just have to teach better. My favorite new one that came from Kenyatta College on this, it speaks to that loss point that we talked about in our developmental sequences, our foundational skill sequences, and that's that first point in the sequence. And so Kenyatta College did a presentation at the um, RP group last spring, 
in which uh, they had folks from all over the discipline, but one of the, uh, all over the college, but one of the disciplines that was represented was the assessment center. And it was really amazing to hear them talk about the change in the assessment center experience, both for the students and for the staff. What they found is they now had, they, they did things a little bit differently. So what they did is before students took the assessment, they got the grades from their local partners first so that they could look at that and have students' placements ready when they came in to assess so they could tell them whether or not they needed to take the assessment. If you want to place higher than this, you can still take the standardized test. But this is your placement already. Right? And I already showed you they're placing a lot more students into transfer level English. The first thing they found was students were profoundly thankful to not have to take yet another standardized test. And they found that their experience with the students was quite different and far more positive that they were spending time helping students figure out what they were going to do rather than helping them navigate this experience of actually being placed far lower than they expected into courses they'd already successfully completed. So I, I gave part of this presentation at the CCI conference um, last fall. And um, the, the, uh, the um, CIO, I, I, I'm sorry, I said CCI, I meant CIO conference. The CIO from Kenyatta stood up to interrupt me which is always like, oh my God, did I say something that wasn't true about their work? And he wanted to add, one of the things that was very powerful for us as an institution is the morale of our assessment and placement staff and faculty really skyrocketed. They were having a very different experience with their work and their interactions with the students. Um, and then the other huge payoff then that I was alluding to is this, students who had that experience where you came in, had this validating experience, were told that you were going to be placed into transfer level, they were much more likely to take that transfer level course than students had essentially the same experience, but that data wasn't available or they didn't do as well and got the same placement. So students who had that validating experience were much more likely to enroll in that course than students that got the same placement via the old method. Right? And one of the things we're going to be doing over the next few years is our enrollments decline. It's chasing students, right? making sure students take the courses we want, making sure students enroll. And one of the ways to do that is to change that front door experience from one in which all of our students essentially have this experience that questions whether or not they belong in the college to one in which works with them, their, the education that they went through to say, we're, we've thought carefully about you. And we have this evidence that actually you're ready to go and we want to make sure that you're on the right path. There's also some very powerful next steps. I know uh, we talked a little bit at the beginning, the steps that you've already taken. So there's other ways to kind of build out from what you've already done. So you can work with us at CalPASS to improve the K-12 coverage in CalPASS, to use students that are already in CalPASS, get data from them. It's all provided free from the grant that CalPASS has under the Chancellor's Office. It's all free for colleges. We have a whole mechanism set up to provide you that data. Uh, I think the mechanism runs every 10 minutes. So as, a student, as soon as a student applies, we can provide you matched data from high school, uh, you know, not quite instantly, but pretty quickly. The other thing that you can do uh, for colleges that are already working with, the, oh, also I would encourage you to consider extending things beyond direct matriculants, right? Lots of our students at Long Beach, one of the things that dogged us Right, as we started with direct matriculants and Long Beach Unified, that's how we set up the program. But what happened then is we really struggled with how to expand beyond that to the other 80% of our students. Right, the students even from Long Beach that matriculated later. The students from other districts. And then you have the long tail. Right, so we have picked up a couple of districts over time. Right, the next biggest one, uh, I was trying to think of some of the other ones. There was Paramount and ABC. And we basically got about four or five other of the districts that were next biggest after Long Beach. But then there's this huge long tail of districts that are sending us you know, 20 students, 15 students, 10 students that add up to a huge proportion of our students, but we couldn't make those arrangements with every single one of those districts to get data from them. And so we were stuck at that level of implementation. And so there are ways, whoops, that's a solid object. Um, there are ways to fill in those other students, so extend beyond direct matriculants, fill it in with self-reported high school data. You guys, I think, are already collecting that via CCC Apply, so you can already start to work on seeing how that might work, how different students, how that might be effective for different students. 
And then there's another possibility that I want to throw out there. So there are lots of colleges that hit this point and go, we're, we're, we're not sure. We have some questions. We have some doubts. We're not sure if we want to go forward. There's a really powerful way to move forward that then also allows you to scale when you're ready. And that is to start with a randomized controlled trial in which you do some of these things so that you can cover as many students as possible. But because it's a new initiative, basically what you do is we're going to do this for some of our students. Right? We're going to do a partial implementation and randomize which students are going to have access to this or not. This gives you a very powerful way to evaluate how well it's working, whether or not it's working for different types of students. Because when they're randomized, right, you're controlling which group they get into. And it takes away all kinds of other possible selection biases history that might be coming into play. So it provides a nice gradated implementation that you can easily scale once you're ready as an institution. Um, the, the other very small positive thing to that is we actually have a little bit of money that we can provide to colleges to help with impl implementation if they decide to do this type of thing. It's very small. It's $10,000 broken up over three increments. So it's, it's basically nothing, but it's enough to help with you know, getting people in the room, providing food, providing some additional programming time, whatever you can use that money for if you decide to do that. So we can provide a little bit of an additional support for that, but as a human being, right, as someone doing this work, right, this is only if you really still have doubts. But for a lot of our students, they can't wait. They're here now, right, and we have a ton of evidence that they're ready to do this work if we give them the chance. So many of us have been working from the presumption of the inadequacy of our students, right? If people talk about this, we think about our students using a deficit model, right, that they can't do the work. But we've been relying on ineffective tools to actually figure out what they can and can't do. Part of that's on us. And so when you look across a whole variety of work, both providing the research foundation of what's possible and the various colleges that have started implementing this, both in California and nationally, it improves the accuracy of placement, it reduces errors, it increases college level or transfer level placement and completion of the sequence, it maintains or improves success rates in those college level transfer level courses, for the most part, maybe some dips, and it has really profound implications for student completion and for equity. So, and this is not something that it costs us a lot, right? Really the remarkable thing about this is a lot of things that we try and do are exceptionally costly, right? We build new technology to support new things. We have all kinds of massive professional development. We have lots of equity interventions that cost us hundreds of thousands of dollars. These are things that we can control with institutional decisions that really don't cost us anything, right? And in fact, in some cases may save us money, right? If you're spending X dollars per student on an assessment test and you provide the assessment via the multiple measures, if the student doesn't take the test, you can still bill the, the chancellor's office for the student completing the assessment because they have, they've completed your assessment process, but you don't have to pay for that test, right? That was one of the first things we looked at at Long Beach is like, holy cow, we could maybe save three to seven dollars per student on this, right? That was a very limited thinking, but it was one of the first things that jumped out at us. Um, and it has enormous savings for students, right? The opportunity cost of this for students is really mind boggling, especially when you start to think of it in terms of the, the size of the college or a community or the system, right? Citrus College has about 4,000 students, uh, new students per year, plus or minus, right? Depending on how, who y'all you count as new. For those 4,000 students, an additional semester of developmental education to retake courses that they've already taken, right, has significant costs for the tuition, has significant costs for books, right? And those are meaningful things, but it also has these massive opportunity costs, right? That increases the length of time you're going to be in college from a semester, possibly to a year. Average salary for a student with some college is somewhere in the neighborhood of about twenty-five to $30,000. But the thing is, you're not losing the average salary, right? Students are losing their last year of salary. They're getting a shorter productive lifespan in the workforce. So they're not losing the average salary. They're losing potentially this huge salary at the end because they have one less year. Or alternatively, if they stay as long, they lose that year of retirement, right? That thing that we're all looking forward to when we can travel or golf or play with the grandkids or avoid the grandkids, whichever one we prefer, right? Like all those things we're looking forward to, our students are getting less of that opportunity, right? They're spending it 
retaking courses that they already successfully completed at another educational institution. So combined with research on alternative approaches to DevEd, some of the things that Kumaka College is doing, the evidence strongly suggests we've been really systematically underestimating our students. Right? We've not done a good job of understanding their capacity. And what we see across this system pretty reliably is that successful students should progress normally, just the same way they do within our system. Right? We don't make students at the end of each one of our courses take another standardized test to determine whether or not they move on. We treat their work in the classroom as being the measure of whether or not they get to move on, even when we know we have pretty stark differences in success rates within our departments. Right? One of the departments I've worked with, I won't say which one, one semester in their transfer level course had a success rate range of 95% on the high end to 2% on the low end. But a C in those courses counted exactly the same institutionally, right? We should treat our educational colleagues at other institutions, at our K-12 uh, uh, partner institutions the same way and with the same respect that we give ourselves. Students who are doing the work should continue to progress normally through the sequences. That's what all this basically shows. And then, as promised, we also need to remember Daedalus's second instruction, right? So one of the things that Daedalus said to Icarus was that it's, not, it's important not to fly too high, the heat from the sun will melt your wings, you'll crash. But the other thing that Daedalus also said was that it's just as important not to start off flying too low. If you start off flying too low, uh, there's a couple of different versions of the myth. One is that the water from the ocean will get your wings wet, you'll lose uh, the ability to fly. The other one is that there's, the air is too humid by the sea and you can't get enough lift. But the bottom line is it's just as dangerous to fly low, right? You might crash into things because you're flying too low. What's happened in the California community colleges over the past two or three decades is we've been absolutely obsessed with making sure none of our students ever start off flying too high, but we've forgotten that it's just as important that they don't start off flying too low. Thank you. Thank you, John. So we put some um, cards on your table, but I know a lot of you aren't shy either. What I was thinking, uh, would this be okay? You probably need a bio break. You probably want to get a sandwich. But John's agreed to stay through lunch, and I'm sure you've got a lot yeah. of questions. And there are a lot of um, important points he's brought up today that I'm sure are worthy of discussion. So does that sound good? We'll take like a 10-minute bio break. You get your lunch, and then have a seat, and then we'll all be ready to ask, ask questions. Sound good? And if you want to write a question down on a card, you're welcome to do that. Right, okay? especially if you're leaving and not coming back. Definitely right. leave a question. Right. We'll answer it to everyone else. And I assume we'll keep recording this through the questions. Yeah. Okay. okay, so you're taping again? All right. So um, the question was uh, how surprising the, the work on self-report is. So basically, there are a couple of things going on. One of the main things is it kind of reveals how much distrust we have of our students, right? That we are not willing to believe that they could actually, when we ask them, tell us the truth about it. Um, and some of that's mistrust and some of it's like, well, maybe they're further out. And it's, it's probably the case that if you got to the people who are 15, 20 years, the further out you get, the less reliable it is. I'm sure that's true. Um, but part of the other thing that's going on that allows it to be much more reliable than you might expect is that it's still a relatively good measure of a much better predictor, right? And so a pretty, good, a pretty good measure of a much better predictor is still going to end up working better than a pretty poor predictor of our student performance. And so it's not perfect by a long shot. And then you always will have the questions of like, well, now if students find out we're using that, will they try and goose themselves into higher level courses? I think the evidence from what we've seen in this work is that that's probably not going to happen. And the reason for that is that most of our students, if anything, tend to have a lack of confidence. So one of the things that's come up on a variety of the projects, of uh, Irvine Valley experienced this a little bit, Rio Hondo for sure, San Diego Community College District, is um, they would often get students who would come in and apply and then assess. And then once they've done that, right, then they would send the data for us to match and we'd send them back the match and they'd say, oh, we have this new information, we're going to place you higher. 
And depending on the college, sometimes that would happen relatively quickly, but sometimes it might be two weeks, three weeks, four weeks later. And so what happens? Those students have kind of thought about how they did on the assessment. They maybe have met with a counselor and built an ed plan. Some of them had already actually enrolled in courses. And so it creates this anchor. And for a lot of our students, right, they have some self-doubt, right? And uh, it's a kind of a classic stereotype threat type of situation, right? That they might be able to function perfectly well until you activate the possibility that they may not have what it takes. And from there, then, the kind of doubt can take over. And then a lot of them, would, when, when faced with that new placement, would say, you know what, I'll just stick with the one that I have. And, and to Tom's point, I was going to say, because we went, because we all lived in the strike team for those webinars, when we put together our pilot study, <clears throat> we decided that we didn't want to give them both scores. We used the disjunctive model, and we only informed them about their highest level placement because we'd heard from so many other colleges where students with that self-doubt chose to take the lower placement. So it'll be interesting to see what our uh, results are based on that. Yeah. One of the, I think, most powerful things to build into this um, that I, I think has been the most successful in some places, and it's part of what you see at Kuyamaka, is for students that are in that zone, part of what's really important is having the uh, education planning conversation with them about which math is the most appropriate for them. Uh, and so there are a lot of students that can be pretty successful in a, a statistics course or a liberal arts mathematics course that maybe won't be as successful in a trigonometry or college algebra course. But that's really the course that they need for, you know, if they're going into sociology or they're going into education or they're going into many of the different career paths that we serve, you know, they maybe don't need trigonometry. And a lot of, uh, of what, what's happened in a lot of places is students often will get that placement and think that's the course they have to take. And so it's really important, I think, to have that conversation with students that have choices at that transfer level to make sure they're getting in the right one. Yes, sir. I was just wondering, what other models? We have the know the co-requisite model to help students succeed? Yeah. Are there any other models out there that schools have implemented? Just out of curiosity. Yeah, so one of the, there's another kind of common model that people use uh, in mathematics is Emporium model classrooms. Mm -hmm. So uh, situations where instead of having a more kind of lecture-based thing, you have students that are working at their own pace, and uh, then you break them out when they get stuck. Um, we did, had some success with that at Long Beach. Um, it was one of the things that we did uh, so uh, just kind of a, uh, a side note on the mathematics side. One of the things that this helped us reveal is what was actually happening in our developmental math that we weren't aware of. So um, one of the things that you probably have noticed, what this implies, is there's lots of students in developmental courses who have previously taken those courses and completed them successfully, right? But they're likely to succeed, right? If you have someone, and we would have lots of students like this who got to pre-calculus, who finds himself back in intermediate algebra or even algebra, right? That student's very likely to succeed. So our success rates in courses like algebra and intermediate algebra were like 45 to 55% on average. So what happens when you only look at students who haven't previously had a math course higher than that, right? So in algebra, what happens when you exclude students who had geometry or higher? The success rates were actually quite low, 15 to 20%. So our math faculty looked at that and realized that what this means is these courses, the students who actually need these courses, who desperately need to complete this material, who haven't successfully completed it before, they're not succeeding because they're in the same course as students who've had many more math courses before. And so that's both led them to support using these types of models to get those students in a more appropriate placement, but also led them then to the Emporium model. So they wanted to work more closely with those students give them a, a variety of different uh, methods to kind of you know, work through the material, and they really ran with it. So they found they had a couple of students in the very first time that they implemented it uh, who started with an algebra placement who made it all the way through intermediate algebra in, in the term because they were allowed to go at the pace they wanted. Uh, and they set it up so they used exactly the same exams uh, in a uh, paper and pencil format just like the normal courses did so the students weren't being assessed in a different way. Uh, and they went from success rates for those students in like the 25 to 35% range to success rates that were actually quite a bit higher than we normally saw, somewhere closer to 70% uh, 
I think one of the instantiations actually made it up to 80, which for us was incredible. Uh, and it's difficult, right? So they use Alex for that method. So they have, you know, they basically they use things like summer sessions and winter sessions where they can uh, uh, commandeer the big library computer lab and teach it. Uh, they co-teach it usually with four, two to four instructors and then some roving tutors to, in order to kind of make the same FTE kind of calculations. Uh, and then, you know, Alex keeps track of the 160 or so students that are doing it. As students get stuck on a particular skill, they can break out, you know, eight or ten students, let's cover the skill, get you through that, and get you moving again. They've had a lot of success. It's kind of like a co-requisite model, sort of, but not really. Like the co-requisite model, you're in the transfer level course and you're getting this concurrent support and just-in-time remediation. This is basically ongoing regular classroom support for the student to move at a pace that they're comfortable. So that's another type of model. Uh, you'll see some places, rather than co-requisite courses, they play around with different combinations of things like supplemental instruction and supplemental tutoring and things like that. Um, you typically don't see that work quite as well because that's typically an add-on to existing developmental ed rather than a way to get people into a higher course. The, 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 the folks in Tennessee have done a little bit of that. So what they do, um, I wish I'd, I'd put those slides in, what they do is they have different types of support depending on your level of test, but everyone is taking transfer level. So some people just take transfer level by itself. Some people have to do transfer level with some, you know, going to a success center and doing these things, and some people get a co-requisite course. They're all in the same class, but they're getting different levels of support based on how much support they need. So great question. Other questions? Yes, sir. Everyone does. I haven't been able to do that, though. Um, so I thought it was um, pretty good. Um, I, I, to be honest, I did. So let me, no, seriously. So when we first did this project, let me tell you the history at Long Beach, right? And I know you're taping this, so I'll try and be as gentle as possible. So when we did this, we were, like everyone, super frustrated with how many of our students were coming from Long Beach based on our assessment test looking like they weren't prepared, right? So when we went into this, what we were trying to do is figure out what combination of courses students took or how they did that would lead them to assess better when they came to us so we could provide guidance to the K-12 so they could get their act together, right? We, our goal was to basically develop some predictive analytics so that we could take K-12 what they should be doing better. So when we did this work, we, did, we looked at how it predicted placement and how it predicted performance and saw how many students actually were much better prepared, we didn't say anything to anyone for like four months. We started over. So we took the, we started fresh, we like did all this work, got to the end and said, we can't tell anyone. We went back to CalPASS, got a fresh cut of the data set, started over from scratch to make sure that we hadn't made any mistakes. That's how skeptical we were. We were like, this can't be true, right? This is so different than what we see it can't possibly be true. And we went through and found exactly the same thing. Some of the coefficients changed because we got a few more students, but it was basically exactly the same. And so it's really what we see at the bottom of all of this is it's not really terribly surprising, right? So part of it is like, yeah, we did a lot of really complicated work. We did lots of logistic regression and oral regression at Long Beach, and we're doing lots of different complicated data mining at the state level to do this. But bottom line, what this all boils down to is something very straightforward that I think all of us recognize as instructors, right? Is that our evaluations in the classroom matter, and they tell you a lot about how students do. But what we've decided is that evaluations across like this segmental seam, we can't, we can't trust those. And what all this work really shows is that it may not be perfectly trustable, but it's relatively highly trustable, and at least as trustable as when students move within our system. All of that, yeah. So, I mean, some of our p-values on the difference for some of the effects at Long Beach, the, I mean, it, it's not really how p-values work, but, you know, it's basically things like p less than 10 to the minus 10, right? So if you did an individual test every second from now, uh, from the beginning of the universe to now, right, you wouldn't observe a result like that by chance. So, I mean, this stuff is super wildly significant. Um, you do see a little bit of differences. I mean, there are places where it's not significant, and that's where the success rates are the same, but you have many more students taking those courses. Um, you know, there is some variation. Well, the biggest variation, I probably shouldn't stand that close to the camera. Sorry, who's ever watching this on TV right now? Um, 
Um, you do see some variation based on how people have set up their assessment systems. So the, the, the biggest place where we see like these problems is where you have that wide transfer level bucket. Right, so we've designed these rules so that you look for students who are likely to be successful in statistics or in liberal arts mathematics or in trigonometry or college algebra, and those have very different entry characteristics for students who are likely to be able to succeed at a 70% or better level. But we don't have assessment systems across the state that allow you to do that. Um, but what that means is that if you have a system like that, you, just, you can't let people base into the transfer level course based on the lowest level. You let them in based on the highest level. Right? So if you have a bucket that includes trigonometry, and anyone in that transfer level assessment can take trigonometry, you just need to make sure that the trigonometry rules are the ones that are in play. Right? Or you have to work more carefully to do it, you know, change your assessment system or work at counseling to make sure. There are other ways to do that. But if you, you want to do the minimum amount of work, that's the way to do it. Yes, sir? When Victoria brought this up to our department, I was worried about trig because I teach intermediate trig and pre-cal. Yep. Yep. Really, the poor result. Mm-hmm. But um, trig, trigonometry really is trigonometry. It's all about measuring triangles, whether they be right, acute, or obtuse. Sure. And so there's a lot of geometry that's required. So I guess that's my big concern is if students get in uh, based on doing well in geometry in high school years ago. Right. Uh, geometry and what's the other one? Intermediate algebra. Okay. And geometry. Yeah. So no one. I mean, no one's getting into uh, no one's getting into trigonometry via our rules that don't basically have those courses. There's a possibility that um, they may have had like an integrative math type of sequence where they're picking up geometry and trigonometry in pieces. Um, the, the biggest challenge we have in marrying the high school track to the college track is that they treat trigonometry differently than we do. Right? So they typically have one or two choices, sometimes a third choice. Trigonometry is often part of intermediate algebra, or it's part of pre-calculus, or part of both of those. And so if you set it up as a prerequisite for um, pre-calculus, there are a lot of students in the state that won't have had a standalone trigonometry course. It's very abstract. It's, you, it's a different kind of a function. Right. No, I, you know, than you've ever seen. I totally agree. Students a lot in that respect, um, but um, I, we just, I just want to make sure that those students are getting in that path. Yep. The STEM path, that's the first experience in that, that there's a positive one. Yep. And, and therefore, if we get too many students into the rather prepared, obviously there's going to be a positive one. So one of the things, uh, let's see, do I have the rules here? Yep. I think I got them here. Right? So it's true that you know, there are some students that might get into trigonometry that weren't there before. But the rules are set up so that you've had to at least successfully completed Algebra 2, and you had to have either been a pretty good student or got further in mathematics. Right? So these are students, basically the rules are set up to get into trig trigonometry. You had to uh, completed, successfully complete Algebra 2 and have a 3-4 or better in high school. Right? A 3-4 or better with a, with a C in Algebra 2 means that you basically did everything right except for that last semester of Algebra 2. Um, or you got to pre-calculus and had a C plus or better, so you finished pre-calculus already um, and had a slightly lower GPA or um, had a better performance in Algebra 2. And so basically what we've done is looking across the entire state, right? we've looked at students who've taken trigonometry at courses as their first course in community colleges across the entire state, which students that do that are the most successful, right? And the students that meet these criteria have success rates that are 70% or higher, right? That's not perfect. Some of those students are still will not succeed. That's what a 70% success rate is. But these are students that are pretty likely to be successful, right? Not perfectly. And one of the things that the Kuhn-Maka College model does is it says, okay, if we, if we don't want to 
accept that you know, it's 70% success rate, maybe we can say for some of these students, we'll let them in, but we'll provide them additional support to make sure that, that those types of little frictional points, geometry being a little bit further ago kind of thing, we can work with them to make sure that they have that in place in the, in the moment that they need it in the course. But I, I mean, I totally get that, right? That's, that's up and down all the levels. Um, so the one place you see a little bit of wiggle room on that is at statistics. So let me go down to statistics, uh, where there's some question about the rules that we allow for students for entry into statistics. Um, so the rules are, unlike the other transfer level kind of STEM pathway maths in trigonometry and college algebra, you only need algebra one to enter statistics for the rules. So a couple of things on that. First of all, Colleges can control that. We have it set up so that if you want to include intermediate algebra there as a prerequisite for statistics, you can. But we also worked with the Common Assessment Initiative Steering Committee as well as the Academic Senate to talk about which students are likely to be successful. And if you look at like, how far students get in mathematics and how successful they are in high school, students who have a 3.0 or higher and finish at Algebra one in high school are more likely to be successful in statistics than students who got further in mathematics but had a lower GPA. So it's weird for us to say that we would keep these students out. Right? It's not perfect, but there's, these students are reasonably likely to succeed. They may have a few gaps here and there, but good students who've gotten at least a solid foundation in algebra are pretty much likely to be able to complete most statistics courses in the state. 60 to 65% success rate. Yes. Hi. Hi, Lisa. I've been working very closely with the early college program. Okay. So, what came out of ABCA being the Yeah. So um, my typical response to that would be those students, are, their GPAs are likely to be more powerfully predictive. Um, we've tried really hard to look for different kind of flavors or weighting to GPA for students who are taking either you know, dual enrollment college courses or have AP courses or IB courses or honors courses, any of those things, right? Um, and what we find is that that actually doesn't increase the um, the accuracy of the projections. And we've kind of struggled with that. It, it, you can use it in some ways. So for example, um, students who have an AP completion in English, they're more likely to be successful. So in Long Beach, we would use that as a plus factor. But using weighted GPAs actually doesn't seem to do a better job than the unweighted GPAs, which was really weird to us uh, until we started kind of unpacking part of what was happening. And part of what was happening is, is um, weighted GPAs tend to be much more prevalent in some districts. And so you can have students that are very capable students that have access to less honors courses and less IP courses and AP courses. That doesn't mean that they don't have that capacity. They just haven't had access to as many. And so what you see is that some of the predictive utility that gains you because they're taking more rigorous courses, you're losing kind of across the system because some students don't have access to as many. And uh, there's actually a fair amount of work that um, a, a gentleman in the UC system, Saul Geiser, has been doing for some time looking at this. And he's basically, almost in every case, comes down on the side of unweighted high school GPA because of the consequences of using the weighting for the distribution of outcomes for students of color, underrepresented students of color in the UC. And so it's, if, if colleges wanted to use a weighted GPA, I think you could very easily make an argument for it, I have no doubt. Um, and you know, what we saw at Long Beach is it tells you a little bit more under some circumstances, but it tends to tell you more on the individual courses than it tells you in the kind of overall aggregate. Did that answer your question? They tend to be highly predictive nonetheless. I mean, one way to think about it is um, all, all of those, every, every course a student takes is an imperfect indicator of their capacity to do academic work, right? 
Um, and they have lots of different things. Some are more rigorous, some are less rigorous. Some have really good instructors, some have less good instructors, right? Sometimes you just don't like the course and sometimes you love the course, right? There are all these other things. And any one course has flaws because it's a single course. But once you start to look at this across multiple different courses, students that are demonstrating consistency across that are basically showing you that it doesn't matter if I like the course or not, or it doesn't matter if that's a great instructor or not, or it doesn't matter if this is more rigorous or not. When I'm asked to do the work in an academic setting, I do it, right? Or don't if you have a lower GPA, right? And so that kind of consistency helps you to kind of see the overall capacity of the student to do work in whatever academic setting. And then we get additional information by how far they get in mathematics or the individual rigor of some of their courses in mathematics or English. That tells us kind of like this incremental additional information, but it doesn't like overwhelm the overall information that you get from collecting the behavior of a student over four years. I, I had all the same things. Like we were really expecting, you know, going back to our original, what we were doing when we first did this, we were like, Maybe we can help them get more students into you know, some AP courses. And the other thing uh, that people spend a lot of time talking about is things like expos expository reading and writing in English. right? Um, and they had another course like that called um, Rhetoric and Composition, right? the rigorous English courses. In fact, one of the things that Long Beach Unified was hoping was that we could help them eliminate some of their other English courses that they thought were less useful for students. So they had a long tail of courses, things like um, film analysis, right? Bible is literature, multicultural literature that various people had concerns about, uh, all of those courses. And what we found is it turned out that a student who was an A student in one of those courses was just as likely to do well as an A student in the other courses, right? And those, those instructors, like the people teaching film analysis didn't basically decide, well, it doesn't matter, I don't have to teach them English, right? They were still teaching them all the things they needed to do to learn how to write well. Right, with all the different gaps that we know about between how students write in high school and how they write in college, all that stuff. But it was the same across expository reading and writing the most rigorous. We're going to prepare you to be college writing, writer and composition, and film analysis. Right? And so basically what we saw is students that were successful in those environments continue to be successful in subsequent environments. Again, is it perfect? No chance. But it does suggest that when the students are re showing you reliable academic behavior, they continue to demonstrate that behavior over time. Yes? Yes. Uh, you mentioned about there are some courses students may move on at their home age. Yes, the, the uh, Emporium model classrooms. Yes, and I have two questions. Sure. Do these students, do they have the time limit to complete this course? courses? A second question is, Different students with a different phases, how the instructor control the progress. Okay. So the, the way that these things typically work is they have um, usually some type of technology based solution that helps kind of track student progress over time. Different people, different institutions use different things. We use a system called Alex that was bought by McGraw Hill now. So it used to be cheaper, it's now part of a bigger, you know, textbook providing institution or organization. Um, but basically way, the way that it works is as students move through, you can track how they've completed different skills. And so the, the thing that we really liked at Long Beach is we could see if like a set of like five or eight students got stuck on one skill, we could pull them out and give them instruction in that specific skill and then they could go back and continue. So basically as instructors, what we ended up doing is being kind of like we put out fires rather than teaching things that the students really actually maybe didn't need as much of our help on. Right, so we could concentrate and focus our efforts on the things that they really needed and not so much on the things that they could get without us. And so, more like the facility. Well, I mean, they did a lot of actual instruction, right? You still had lectures all the time, but you were doing uh, more lectures on demand. And so there was some challenge for the initial startup because, you know, when students got stuck, you had to think, okay, what do I pull out of my course that treats this particular skill so they can move on? So there was some startup on that. Um, but then once they got that going, uh, you know, they'd work in teams of four, they rotate in different people in different semesters. Uh, and so different people have different expertise in, you know, specific subtopics that allowed you to break that out. Um, they've also experimented with it a little bit in single classrooms or in uh, like dual classrooms where you have two small computer labs side by side. 
so that you can have the cooperative effort between instructors. Um, but yeah, it's not, the Emporium model classrooms actually go back quite a long ways. People have been trying this in mathematics for some time. Um, and it just gives, uh, oh, so to go back to your other question, how much time did they get? Um, there are some systems, the Virginia Community College system has actually experimented with a method in which they've actually disaggregated each of the individual skills in dev ed. So rather than have three or four or five unit courses, you have one unit courses that you complete on your time frame. Right? You still have to usually complete it in a semester, but you know, it's one unit, so it's a lot less work than a three to five unit course. Uh, so they've disaggregated that to give them the freedom, like do you, do you have two weeks now to finish one, or you want to finish it over the semester, you can. Uh, the ones that have been done in California that I know of have done, basically done it within the same semester or intercession structure. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes? Okay. Yep, that's a great question. Um, basically what we found is that students that are in mainstream classroom, classrooms with an IEP or an accommodation, their data is similarly predictive for college, probably with the presumption that they're still receiving the IEP, right? So if you have a student who has an IEP that's receiving a specific accommodation in high school, that's built into what, how they're able to succeed. Um, and so if they don't get that from us because they don't apply or we don't notice or whatever the case may be, then you're going to have some disjuncture. The, the bigger problem we have is students who have a disability who don't have an IEP in high school and that we discover or they discover in 12th grade um, that, you know, oh, shoot, I've had this undiagnosed dyslexia. Uh, and they finally, you could see they have better results in 12th grade. So we haven't been able to really fine tune it for those students yet, so it would probably be under predictive for them. For students who are in um, non-mainstream courses, typically those students, uh, you're gonna have to find solutions the way you normally would have at your institution. Like there, there's a couple of issues, one of which is there aren't as many of them. And so these types of statistical techniques rely on having a lot of statistical power, which means you need to have a lot of students. Um, and there are fewer of them, so we can't come up with models that are as effective. So normally for things like um, students with disabilities or with, uh, to some extent, how you determine whether or not a student is going to go into an ESL track versus an English track, right? A lot of colleges still need to make that same determination. Once you do, we have different rules for those different students, but how did you determine whether or not a student should go into ESL versus English before? We don't have a better method than whatever you're currently using. Right? And the same thing with you know, whether, how to treat students who might have uh, different um, curriculum being provided to them in high school. It's an excellent question. It's one that we keep trying to work on, especially the ESL population is even bigger, and trying to kind of navigate um, how students who are you know, in the mainstream but are ELL students, right? they're English language learners, but are in mainstream English, what it seems to be the case is that they look just like everyone else, the other challenge we have with ESL students, and I'm not sure what your local experience has been, but when ESL students are given the choice, many of them will choose a mainstream English course for a variety of reasons. So what we find is students who are ELL in high school, about 85% of them are ending up in mainstream English and reading courses. And so would those students be better served by ESL sequences? Quite possibly but they're already demonstrating their decision that they, either their decision or our lack of providing them appropriate information. However you're getting students into ESL versus mainstream English and reading, what we encourage you to do is to continue to use that system and work with that and just check to make sure that students who, you know, were basically in mainstream English essentially stay in mainstream English. That's what the data typically suggests. And we have a whole sub paper on ESL to talk through like all these various issues. Yes, sir. Yeah. You would have students, students with a wide array of skill sets. Is there a possibly. possibly? So the thing to think about um, is right now what we see is we already have some of that wide array because we're using a measure that's actually not that correlated with how they do, right? So one of the things, one of uh, the one of my favorite little sub parts of this. Um, uh, one of the researchers on the project, Terrence Willett at Cabrillo College, did some Monte Carlo simulations to see, like, if you knew zero math, 
right? No math. You couldn't add, you knew nothing. And basically came into that and just answered randomly, where would you place, right? They were using the MDTP. And so students, uh, all those Monte Carlo simulations of, of the, I think they were like, ran like 10,000, um, something like 18% of students placed in intermediate algebra or higher. Just because when you have a lot of students that are guessing, some people are going to guess right if you have a small enough sample, right? So we already have some of that because we're using something that's not that correlated with performance. The real thing that I think changes for upper level classes, and this is going to be true in transfer level English and some of the transfer level math courses, is that you don't necessarily get a set of students with different, different levels of skills in the discipline, but they have different levels of familiarity with college. Right, so I don't know what it's like here, but like our, our transfer level English courses, they were basically filled mostly with students who'd been at the college three or more years. So it's basically like teaching a junior level seminar, right? They've learned where the library is and where all the resources are and who they can go to and all those things. Now in a transfer level English course, or now in you know, some transfer level math courses, you don't have students that have gone through like all of that, what is college? How do I prepare in college? How do I, how do I act in a college classroom? Right? It doesn't mean they can't do the work, but they're new college students, right? It's, and one of the things that I think is worth thinking about is that's part of what these courses originally did for us. Right? You think about how freshman English, when it used to be called freshman English everywhere, right? Part of what it did is it helped everyone acclimatize to what it was like to be a college student. And it hasn't been that way in our system for a long time. And so now those, some of those skills where we help people navigate, hey, this is how you study in college. This is, you know, you have to keep, I'm not going to be able to track everything for you. I don't see you every day. You have to be independent. Part of that falls on us in the classroom again because it's not happening in dev ed, right? Because they, they, didn't, they didn't need the dev ed content, but they were also getting all that kind of get used to college stuff there that now we have to be able to provide, right? So that, that is very different. And that, you know, that, the difference between having someone who's been in college for three years and someone who's fresh out of high school, that's different. Right? That's, I, I'm not going to kid you, those are not the same teaching experiences. But it's also the case that those students, content-wise, are pretty much ready. I'm glad you brought that up because it's one of the things the multiple measure Frank team has been talking about for the last year. And one of the things, because we know that now we've got those pilot study students in your classes, um, we expanded that, you know, we, over the years we usually typically go to about 70 basic skills classes. So far, we've gone to 90, and then um, Lana and I were looking uh, recently at other courses that have lots of college freshmen in them that aren't math or English, and we're trying to go to those courses too. And then, uh, in terms of professional development, we've um, we've submitted two flex day presentations. One's with Dr. David Morrison, who works with our Disabled Student Programs and Services Office. Because um, he's been working with students um, who are autistic typically, but he knows a lot about all kinds of learning disabilities. And he not only works with the students and their parents on their behavior in class, he's also available to work with instructors. Mm -hmm. So then, you know, like the, the parents are getting help about how to let go, the students are learning how to behave in your class, and then also, he's willing to provide you with tips. He, he wants to do a workshop with Flex Day. And then the other one is um, we're going to do some on course to success workshops. Some of the folks here, right in Victoria, who also talk about on course to success. Yeah. Um, and and there, I think Robin McBurney, one of our instructors, is going to be teaching some classes Flex Day too. Um, and then also, uh, our Vice President of Academic Affairs has said that he would be willing to send more people to those on-course uh, workshops to kind of help everyone get more professional development. I, I wanted to kind of follow up because there's a second part to that question that actually turns out to be really important. And that is, um, so you're talking about, you know, do we have more heterogeneity possibly in some of these upper level courses? The bigger challenge for us at Long Beach when we implemented this was the reduction in heterogeneity in our dev ed. Right? Because now the students who are actually in algebra are just students who really need algebra. And so what happened is the students that we could rely on to help other students, because they'd already had the math and this was coming pretty quickly to them, right? that they could either help other students or the ones we could call to the board or call in in class, 
um, or we could just allow them to go at their own pace while we gave other students individual attention, those students aren't there anymore, right? Because they're in a class that's more appropriate for them. But that means more of the students that are there, they need us. And so that is a much more demanding situation when everyone is at the same, you, you've lost that heterogeneity in capacity. So it's going to lead to some changes in how you think about your pedagogy. Pedagogy? I'm not sure. I didn't quite get the right syllable on that. Um, in the course, right? How, how, is, how am I going to teach this? You know, what types of things do I need to make sure to do that before I could take for granted? Because every student in that course now is really going to need that course. Right? And the same thing for English, right? You're going to have the same thing where the most accomplished, highest performing students who actually could have succeeded in transfer level are now going to be in that transfer level course. So the students that remain are going to be students that struggle more, that are less attentive to, you know, doing drafts and turning in work on time and all those types of things. Yes? Yeah. Just naturally in a class. So one of the things, I, I, that's part of why um, the folks at Kuyamaka are doing the types of things they're doing, where you're basically maintaining that type of distribution in the class, but providing differential support for students who need more. Right? That kind of resumes that. This is, the, the multiple measure system uh, basically doesn't rely on holding students um, back in order to help us in the classroom, right? So, that, I mean, it's, it's not the student's job to help us teach courses that they've already had before, right? It's great for us in the classroom, but it's really not, they're not getting paid for it, right? They're not even TAs, but they end up functioning in some ways like that. Um, and so, if we, if we really want to restore that, then the, the powerful way to do that is to look more carefully at how we can build in co-requisites and move more students up rather than hold the students who are capable back. I think there was a, was there a question at your table? It might have just been a stretch or a beard scratch. Okay. All right. Anything else? Okay. So I'm going to stick around. Um, I, I really appreciate it. The first thing I want to say is thank you so much for staying this long. No, I, this is, I can't tell you how much I love doing this. Right? Like, I've worked on so many different projects in my life, both as a faculty member and in institutional research. There's been very little in my life that has been as meaningful as working with faculty all across the system as working on something like this. It has profound implications for how we understand our students, how we work with our K-12 partners, and whether or not the students that we serve who desperately need our help can make it through to meaningful educational outcomes. This is really like a profoundly important thing that we can all actually have relatively straightforward impact on. So I really appreciate everyone staying for that um, and staying, you know, it's a Friday afternoon, it's a beautiful day outside, so thank you for listening. And um, I, can we, can you log me in so I can put my phone number back up? <laughs> so uh, it, 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 so I, I'm serious, I really want, if you guys have questions, do not hesitate to email me, call me. I mean, with the phone call, I've had a couple of people call me at like 11.30 at night. It's a little bit of a stretch. So like if we could keep it between like 8 and 8 or 8 and 9, I'm really happy to help you as often and as much as I can. I've come back to many colleges multiple times for like micro presentations. We have lots of support through the Multiple Measures Assessment Project website. I don't want you to feel like you've had questions that weren't answered or things that were left out, um, because this is work that all of us participate in together. So, so let me just, I'll just tell it to you. So my email is j-h-e-t-t-s, j-hetz, at edresults.org, e-d-r-e-s-u-l-t-s dot -E -E org. And my phone number is 714-380-2678. So there it all is. And we have tons of resources. We have you know, the research that we've done, some of the papers we've written. We have a new one that'll be it's going, it's uh, under review at Community College Review right now. So that'll be on the website as soon as that's done. Um, there's resources for pilot colleges. We have webinars that we run all the time. So, so we actually have one coming up on Tuesday. Kumaka College is gonna talk, um, Imperial Valley and 
uh, I forget who, a Skyline. They're going to talk about their results to date and how they got, they get about 20 to 25 minutes each. So all of those things are available. Please ask questions. Please take advantage of all of this stuff. All of this is available to every college for free. So thank you very much. John's been out twice now, and then one of his partners, Ken Sori, came and talked to our K-12 administrators in May about a lot of these same subjects. Here's how I know John loves this. When I met John, I was at a, a conference, and all the Long Beach City College people were sitting together, and John came to join us. And he could have been, had a beer talking about anything, but we talked about the multiple measures of government projects. And um, so I know that it's something that he's passionate about, and I'm so appreciative of how willing you've been to answer our questions, how helpful you've been. All the colleagues at Educational Results Partnership have... Um, and the RP been, group. And the RP yeah, group. the RP group have been really accessible. So, so I want to thank John one more time. It's our pleasure.